Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our live broadcast in Second Life. And locally, the real reason for doing this every night is that I have meditators here, people who are dedicating their whole waking hours to the practice of insight meditation. Doesn't that just sound like something you all would like to do? If you haven't done it, I'm going to introduce you tonight to someone who has just graduated and graduated means he just finished our our foundation course but he's actually someone who's been practicing insight meditation for quite a while I first met him in Winnipeg several years ago 2013-ish, 12, I can't remember uh, 11 maybe um, and yeah, he, he, he's been, we've been keeping in touch and practicing similar styles and finally he's come over to try out our technique. So I'd like to get his take and see how this course, uh, so what part it play, it's played in his practice. This is Ali. Hello everyone, uh, my voice comes across well? Yeah. I think so. Uh, so my name is Ari, as Banta mentioned, uh, I met him about four years ago in Winnipeg. And uh, now that I reflect back, uh, in those days uh, Bante always talked about the meditation center. And uh, now that I came here and meditated for three weeks, I'm so happy that uh, to see that actually realized and what a beautiful uh, space and uh, community has been created here. It's, it's amazing. It's so lovely to see uh, practitioners, supporters from different countries, uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, other, other countries from Canada who uh, who really are very generous and uh, support this center and uh, to have Bonte here really to just present the authentic Buddhist uh, teachings is so valuable to have all these uh, all these um, support for us to practice and uh, the atmosphere is so conducive the teachings are so on point and direct um, and if if someone really uh, is fortunate enough to you know can take you know 20 30 days of their lives and dedicate practice um, and practice here under um, with these you know well uh, planned well well uh, well thought methods then that then the results are are you know certain i would say and uh, so yes that's what i uh, just came across now and i know it well it's it's so i always put people on the spot um, and I know it's you've just come out of the course, so it's hard to really mm. get everything sort of settled in your mind. But how do you feel coming into the course? You've you've been a meditator before, so it mm. can't have had a, a life changing. You know, not it, it hasn't turned your life from night to day. But how is how do you feel this course has has played a part in your practice? Mm. Uh, I I feel very healthy now. I I wasn't three weeks ago, even th and m my practice has 
had become a little bit weaker than it used to be like three four years ago mm. uh, in the past I would say three months something three, four, six months and as a result I was uh, more stressed and uh, mm, uh, here uh, I, it, I really wanted to come here to kind of I think uh, what in my mind I, I thought you know I, I had realizations and uh, I just need to uh, deepen them but uh, but here it was a truly humbling uh, experience I, I, I learned a lot about uh, uh, about the, the suffering and kind of the mistakes that I you know I have been making in in, in my life and uh, places I wasn't mindful and uh, and kind of then really I think uh, experienced what in, in, in with much more clarity uh, what I think I just had some glimpse uh, about before but um, really like this uh, th this course uh, just helped me to really to a uh, point of no return as <laughs> so I would say it's just it's things are so clear that uh I don't think I would they could ever forget and not not see them again so uh, uh, yeah and I, I feel very healthy now and th that's essentially what I, w I would summarize like I, I feel I was sick and now I'm well <laughs> hmm. mm. Wow thank you that's thank you. great great words Congratulations to Ali for making it through meditation course. It's we had. Um, I remember once listening in on reporting before I was teaching. Before I started teaching, we in Thailand they get a lot of Israeli uh, meditators. A lot of Israelis go to Thailand because they have to serve in the war and or not in the war. They have to serve in the army and. After the army, they all run away to Thailand. It's apparently a thing. India as well, but they leave the country. So anyway, um, you get a lot of Israeli meditators, and one of them, he, as he was finishing the course on like the l second to last day, he said, "You should teach this to the Israeli army. This is harder than anything I had to do <laughs> in my military training." And if you know anything about the Israeli military, it's, uh, that's, that is saying something, <laughs> from what I hear. It's not easy. The great thing about the meditation practice is it's, it's, it's pushing, it pushes you beyond, it pushes you far, f so far out of your comfort zone. But it's, uh, but it does it gently. <laughs> it's like uh, it's it's a soft brick. It's getting hit in the head with a brick wrapped in a pillow or something like that. It's very we push the meditators very hard, but we do it slowly, and it's it's the power of mindfulness uh, is so strong that you don't really even uh, falter most people don't even falter I don't think I've had a single person who got beyond the the, the basic you know the, the first few days or the first I got over the first sort of uh, adjustment pains since I've been back in Canada I don't think I've had a single person run away I mean it says something to their dedication that they're willing to come all the way to Canada to do this, but um, you know, it's been really super high high uh, graduation rate. Very few people 
I, mean, I think there's been a few people who leave after a few days because it was much more difficult than they thought and they just weren't ready for it, prepared for it. But uh, by and large, it's the kind of difficulty that you that you're happy to do, that you you're glad to 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 challenge yourself with. I think that's why people leave in the beginning is because they weren't they weren't expecting a challenge. So that's the one thing I try to get across to people, especially when they're thinking of coming to do a course, is that it's not easy. It's not meant to be pleasant all the time or calming. And some people are looking for that and and. I mean, most people, I think, to some extent, are expecting that. They're expecting peace, even subconsciously. And so a big part of the um, basic, or the, you know, the, the, the beginning stages of the Course are helping someone come to terms with the fact that reality isn't uh, butterflies and rainbows or whatever. <laughs> that reality is uncomfortable. And so helping meditators to come outside of their comfort zone and to challenge everything that they hold you know, as, as, as real, as dear, as, as me, as mine, and so on. But it's a whole other level. Those people who have never done, if you've never done an intensive course, as Ali was saying, uh, it's it's great to hear the idea that uh, you you get this idea that through your practice you're gaining insight. That's true. You you certainly are, but you tend to overestimate. If you just do daily practice, you tend to overestimate your your progress. You know, you fit meditation into your life without actually challenging you know, your identity, your personality, your likes and dislikes, you know, without really challenging samsara. The meditation challenges the whole, the meditation course, it's designed to challenge all of samsara, the whole of your existence, the very framework of what it means to experience. And so you're taken to places, I mean, at the end it, it can get kind of surreal where you're, you're your experiences are, are uh, you know, your mind can sometimes be playing tricks on you and it feels like reality is just uh, moments of experience. You, know, you lose track of the world around you and you see only reality. And you're able to break it apart and, and let go and attain to true peace. And so... Uh, you know, we can never say what, we can't really talk about what meditators get out of the practice. This wouldn't be fair because we ourselves are not, we're not, we're not a Buddha that we can, we're not equipped to pronounce people as having gained this or that attainment on, on any level. But it's encouraging to, to hear these things and this is a tradition my teacher would always make a point of having meditators uh, talk about their just the feeling that they get how they feel how different they feel as a means of encouraging others and uh, making clear that this is a positive experience it's not something to be afraid of i mean the great that's the the great thing about how the meditation challenges you. you. You start to realize that it's not the meditation that's hard. It's that we're not, um, you know, we're not programmed for it. It's our own mind and our own defilements that makes the meditation hard. And so you, you take refuge in the meditation over your own personality. You come to be your own enemy and and uh, the meditation is a better friend than you are to yourself. And so by using this, this growing seed of mindfulness, you start to root out all the stuff inside that's causing you harm. I mean, that's really it, is we are our worst enemies. There's no worse enemy than the untrained mind. This is what we, this is the paradigm shift that has, to, the shift that has to take place rather than 
in the beginning a meditator will see the meditation as a problem the meditation is the enemy it's what's causing me suffering and when they make that break they start to realize wait a minute I'm the one it's my problem it's not the meditation and it, sh it reverses you start to use the the Buddha's teaching to overcome yourself so this is the best thing that I could encourage on on anyone is to take the time I mean it's why teaching has always been a part of my life as a Buddhist monk not because I'm terribly keen to teach but because of how 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 powerful it is and what a great thing it is to go through the course you know, how 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 transformative it is not just of an individual but of of society of of the world to have people in it that have cultivated such depth of understanding to the very core of, of experience, the core of reality. And it's not some theoretical or, or it's not a it's not an equation, something you can put down on paper, but it's a purity, the mind that is free from greed, anger and delusion. It's the ability to see the nature of your own mind. And so uh, through the foundation course, you of course don't become, I, mean, I don't know that anyone I've ever seen has become an arahant from doing a a, medita a single course. I mean, not that I would be able to tell. But the first thing it does, it's called uh, but, uh, Pachawekananyana. At the very end of the course, when a meditator is starting to settle back down after going through the whole, uh, the whole, the whole uh, program, they take stock. The mind begins to assess what has changed, and so th the meditator who has gone through the course is is at this unique position where they can see their own minds, where they're clear about their 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 position on the path so they see what what they've where they've where they've come what they've accomplished what they've attained they maybe not you know exactly there's it's not into you know completely clear what they are or what they've attained but you know, they they see the difference and then they also see the road ahead. They see quite clearly what they have left to do because they've spent the past two, three weeks living with their own mind, uh, studying their own mind. And so they're quite clear what needs yet to be done, quite clear what bad habits they still have, what uh, confusion might still be in the mind, what delusion there still is to root out. So as I said before, someone someone said it's like seeing the seeing that what you've been studying is only the tip of the iceberg, but you've you've come to understand that. You know that's really a big part of the finish of the course. Is in the beginning throughout the course you're working on the iceberg that you can see above water. When you get to the end, you can you see, you see underwater, and you see what's left to be done. So I thought that would be a sort of a special edition of our talk tonight, our session tonight, that would give you all a little bit of encouragement from someone who's been practicing for a while and and is able to give an honest review of the process. For those of you who are here doing the course with us, or those of you who are thinking to, those of you who want a better understanding, for all of us to get a sort of a better understanding and clarity about what doing an intensive meditation course entails. So thank you, Ali. And I'm going to give that up for tonight's Dhamma. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them.
Otherwise, have a good night. I saw in a video that insinuation is a branch of lying. Is this true? No, it's it's on a different level because actually outright lying is is like uh, you commit, you've committed to it. You know, it's like the difference between hurting someone and killing them. You kill and and uh, you've committed. I mean, it's, it's a bit more extreme, but there's still there's still room to back out when you're just insinuating something. It's not. It's clearly an immoral. You know, there's there's the, the different. If you're trying to trick someone, that's not a good thing. If you're trying. You know, though you could argue you could you're trying to trick them for for wholesome purposes. I think you could potentially argue that. You could argue that. There are cases where Arahants have actually tried to trick trick people. Uh, but they don't lie. Because lying is on another level. Lying is... Uh, lying is the commission of, of, of uh, deception. It's, it's, on a, it's a level of deception that is... It's, it's it's a perversion, right? Because truth and wisdom are so important, and to s say as false, say as true something that is false, or say as false something that's true, is uh, it's a strong. There's a there's a weight to it. It's not. It, karma is not is never black and white. It all comes down. The only thing black and white is our our state of mind when we do things. So a person can tell a lie with the best intentions, and it won't be that negative. The consequences won't be that negative karmically. A person can tell a very small lie with very bad intentions, and it can have very weighty karmic consequences. And if they feel guilty about it afterwards, it will be even worse, because guilt, of course, is also unwholesome. But no, we, we don't consider deception, simple deception, as, as lying or insinuation. It's much more, I mean, it's it, it helps to draw a clear distinction, if nothing else, that, uh, you know, if you're going to be deceptive, we're all deceptive in various ways, we, we're not perfect, and so through our defilements we'll manipulate each other and deceive others, but... We take as a vow that we won't go to the extent of actually outright lying. That's the idea, is that it's it's crossing a line. And you can argue it's just a line in the sand, it's not real, it's just a concept, but there is something to it, and it helps sort of set a marker for us. At the very minimum, we won't do that, even though we might deceive each other from time to time. We won't outright lie. I mean, if you think about it, because... Lies are so terrible. When you tell a lie and someone believes it, it's you know, it's not just that they insinuated something, it's that they said and you believe them, right? And we're so we, we don't have telepathy that we can understand, so we believe each other and we have to. We rely upon words, statements. Insinuation is is, is not that. And you actually outright lie. It's such an, a terrible thing. The Buddha even said, if a person lies, there's not, no, no evil they won't commit. 
I think he said in the Jataka or somewhere or else it was the Bodhisatta, I can't remember. Lying is the worst. If, if a person lies, there's no evil that they won't commit. So it's uh, definitely considered to be a bad one. Well, there's the, the famous case and it's just in the Dhammapada commentary so it could always be uh, suspicious, uh, dubious authenticity um, where Sariputta tells this ex this executioner says, you know, he can't concentrate on, on Sariputta's teaching because he's, he's feeling guilty about all the killing that he's done ex executing people and so Sariputta asks him, you know, well did you do it for did you do it because on your own behest or did you do it because someone else told you to and he said well I did it because someone else told me to and and Sariputta says well then did then how can you say it's your fault or is it really your fault I think he asks him well then is it really are you really to blame with the insinuation or the implica implying that he wasn't to blame but of course he was you know you don't get out of killing just because someone else tells you to it's still a very terrible thing that he did, but it's a deception. Sorry, Buddha actually, in a sense, deceived. Now, you might argue that an arahant wouldn't do that. I'm, I, I, I would, I would, I would argue that an arahant would would not be afraid. I mean, it's all about your intentions for the most part until you cross those lines there's something decisive about actually saying something that's false it's on a different level from implying even tricking people when you outright lie to them it's it's evil Okay, well let's call it a night then. Wishing you all good practice, happy trails. <laughs>